Tonight, a special report, imperialism and what it means for you. For more, we're joined by our special reporter, Tim. In the late 19th century, the economies of world markets were shifting as industrial mass production reached new heights. Lenin and his Marxist contemporaries saw the growth of monopolistic companies, watched as they came to dominate their local markets, and then turned their gaze to foreign ones. The notion of imperialism, as they called it, described the economic and political control exerted by foreign nation-states and companies over smaller local ones. It was feared that if left unchecked, these foreign monopolies would have vast economic control over entire industries, that Russian trained manufacturing, for example, could be entirely supplanted by British companies, thus leaving the entire industry subject to the whim of foreign capitalist overlords. When it comes to technological innovations, few can be said to have has had as big an impact on communications theory as the moving picture. As the 20th century progressed, the American media landscape became increasingly saturated by the vast cultural juggernaut that is Hollywood. And once local markets were accounted for, Hollywood turned its insatiable gaze outwards. By the mid 20th century, communication scholars had noted the rapid spread of predominantly Western made cultural artifacts throughout the rest of the world. As one media scholar so aptly described it, cultural imperialism has claimed that authentic, traditional and local culture in many parts of the world is being overwhelmed by the indiscriminate dumping of large quantities of slick commercial media products, mainly from the US. This is a familiar phenomenon for anyone who has gone overseas and found locally made versions of American Idol and Big Brother. The end of the 20th century brought with it new challenges as the power of sovereign nations waned in the face of an increasingly globalised economy. All of a sudden, the original conception of imperialism as a result of industrialised powers spreading across the world like a super capitalist zerg creep failed to accurately describe the deep complexities of modern communications and economies. On top of that, postmodernity was born into a crucible of whiny introspection. So now everyone was wrong, but everyone was also right, and nothing got done because academics everywhere were too busy squabbling in the dirt over semantics. Yet these new digital services were precisely what academics pointed to as evidence of information imperialism. A constant stream of communications and economic capital brought to bear by an overwhelming majority of Western media, finance and technology companies and forcing these markets to either compete with these American companies on their own terms or to be subsumed by them. The modern context finds us examining the role of successful Western tech companies as they expand ever outwards. Proponents of platform imperialism maintain that flows of culture and technology are asymmetrical. Tech companies like Google, Amazon and Facebook are not value neutral platforms and therefore, in having been so ex successfully exported to foreign markets, have been able to disseminate their Western-dominated cultural hegemony throughout the rest of the world. Here's how it works. Platform imperialism assumes that there are two primary forms of control. Cultural dominance and economic dominance. Economic dominance is ensured due to the vast majority of successful tech companies, and therefore their intellectual property, being controlled by Western companies. The vast majority of smartphones run on either Android or Apple operating systems, software platforms that have been designed and controlled by American companies. The accumulation of intellectual property is key since it ensures that any royalty and license fees feed invariably back to the parent Western company. Arguably more important though is cultural dominance. To understand cultural dominance you have to understand one simple premise. People don't work in a vacuum. Whether consciously or not, people who make things invariably stamp their cultural values, biases and preferences onto their creations. Facebook is not just a social media platform, it's a reflection of the values of the people who made it. The forms of speech, the hierarchy of content, the user interface all reflect a distinctly Western value set, but it doesn't just stop there. The code upon which the software is built is overwhelmingly designed for English speaking users. You want to write a program but you only speak in Arabic? Good luck! because there is a steep learning curve ahead of you. Even the structure of web addresses, URLs, enforces this notion. Australian websites end in .au, French in .fr, Indian in .in. 
but American sites have no such suffix, and the absence normalises American yeah. users, positioning them as it being at the centre of the online world, whereas everyone else has their own cordoned off little corner of the net. So regardless of what you call it, cyber imperialism, platform imperialism, metrocentric or hegemonic discourse imperialism, what it means is that the vast majority of websites, software and the internet itself all combine to form a medium that is by its very nature requires users to communicate in a manner that subordinates anything that doesn't conform to the dominant discourse. It is subtle, pervasive and almost utterly omnipresent. Even if the marginalised voices are given the space and power to counter the dominant metrocentric discourses, it is still through a vehicle which is indisputably Western. Thanks Tim for that fascinating insight. Coming up after the break, LOLCATS! Is your kitty cute enough? Find out more. <laughs>